Welcome to Good Book. I'm Mark Strauss, and we are continuing our series called History, or His Story, the whole Bible in 18 weeks. We covered the Old Testament in nine weeks, and now we're well into the New Testament. In the New Testament, we started with the intertestamental period, the historical period between the Old Testament and the New, that 400 silent years. We found out they weren't silent at all. There was all kinds of history that took place during those 400 years. Next, we moved into the Gospels, and we spent two weeks looking at the Gospels. We recognized that the Gospels were four portraits, four unique portraits of the one Jesus. We divided the Gospels into two studies because there's two different kinds of Gospels, you might say. There are the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means viewed together or very similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels because they present the same basic chronology of Jesus' life in the same sort of a format and main themes. Then last week we looked at the Gospel of John, the fourth Gospel, which is very unique in many ways. Strong focus on the identity of Jesus, on his true deity and true humanity. Now we're moving on beyond the Gospels. One of the Gospel writers, Luke, actually wrote a second volume. We call it the Book of Acts. And together, Luke and Acts really are two volumes of a single work. In other words, when Luke began to write the gospel, he already had Acts in mind. And you really don't finish the story of Luke's gospel until you get to the end of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, he refers back to his earlier book. He says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. That statement shows us a couple of things. First of all, Luke's gospel is the story of Jesus, the acts of Jesus, we could say, but it's only part one. That was his former book. Now the book he's writing at this point, we call the book of Acts. It's really the acts of Jesus, part two. The first book was what Jesus began to do. This is what Jesus continues to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. Another way you could look at this is the gospel of Luke is salvation accomplished. As Jesus um, lives his life, a perfect life, he, he announces the kingdom of God, he goes to Jerusalem, he suffers and dies, and then rises again victorious, accomplishing our salvation. So we can now have faith in his life, death, and resurrection, and have eternal life with God. That's salvation accomplished. The book of Acts, then, is salvation announced as the church in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaims the message of salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's really the theme we're going to look at in the book of Acts, the gospel to the ends of the earth. I want to start and talk about the author. We didn't have time to talk about authors when we talked about the gospels, but let's talk about the author, fascinating character. His name was Luke, of course. Um, And Luke, what do we know about Luke? We know he was a physician, a doctor. We know that because Paul refers to him in one of his letters. In Colossians 4.14, he says, Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, sends his greetings. Now, Luke was an ancient doctor, not like a modern doctor, so he didn't have the same kinds of medicines or techniques, but in many ways, the Greeks invented medicine. Uh, They invented medicine in the sense that they invented the idea, they recognized the idea that these the disease wasn't just caused by things like magic or by demons, that it was actually related to physical causes. You might have heard of Hippocrates or the Hippocratic Oath, which was sort of the first statement of what a doctor is to do, to do no harm, to do only good. So Luke was a doctor, an ancient doctor, but a doctor nevertheless. Secondly, what Luke was, and even more important from Luke's perspective, is he was a missionary, an associate of the Apostle Paul. Paul actually refers to Luke in several of his letters. In Philemon, he says this. He says, Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark and Luke, my fellow workers. Some people call Luke sort of Paul's personal physician, but that's not what Paul calls him. Paul calls him my fellow worker. He's a fellow missionary, in other words. Even at the end of Paul's life, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he points out, only Luke is with me. He's writing to Timothy, and he says, get Mark and bring him with me. I'm lonely. I want my my associates, those I've worked with for years, to come and be with me in ministry. 
We also know that Luke was with Paul because of what we call the we sections in the book of Acts. It's fascinating because the book of Acts, the narrative is in the third person. So it'll, be, it'll say, Paul did this. Paul and Silas did this. They did this. They did this. And suddenly it starts saying, we did this. We did this. It starts in Acts chapter 16, verse 10. Paul is in Troas and sees a vision of a man beckoning him to come across to Macedonia. And the author of, of Acts says, and after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And the next, for the next seven or eight verses, it's all we's. So Luke is clearly with Paul. He joins Paul and the other missionaries at that point. We don't know the circumstances. We just know he's there. And then the we section stops in a few verses, and then it picks up later in the book of Acts. You can see those references there to when are we sections, when Luke is clearly traveling with Paul at those various points. So he was an eyewitness to many of these events recorded in the book of Acts. The third thing we learn about Luke is that he was a Gentile, and that's highly unusual because probably most all, if not all, of the other New Testament writers were Jewish. A Gentile simply means someone who isn't Jewish. How do we know Luke was a Gentile? Well, again, Paul makes a reference to that. Paul names a number of his Jewish associates. He, he says, Aristarchus and Mark send you their greetings. And then he says, these are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. Then he says, others send their greetings. And he says, our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas also send greetings. So he says, these are my Jewish friends. These are my non-Jewish friends who send greetings. So suggesting Luke is a Gentile, uh, not Jewish. Now that makes his theme, the central theme of his book, so interesting because as a Gentile, Luke shows special interest in how the gospel, which began in Judaism, which really is, is founded on the Old Testament promises, went to the Gentiles, went to all nations of the world. That's sort of, as we'll see, one of the central themes of the book of Acts. So he's a Gentile. The fourth thing we learn about uh, Luke is that he is a historian a top-rate historian. This is how he begins his gospel. Look at the number of terms of historical veracity that appear here. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you've been taught. Do you see all that language of eyewitness testimony, of, of research investigation, of making sure he got it right so that you can know for sure that this is true? Luke is, is obsessed with getting the story right, passing on accurate histor history. So there's the author, the Gentile historian, physician, and theologian as well. From the author, let's look at the recipients. The author is written, or the, the, the books, both books, Luke and Acts, are written or addressed to Theophilus. At the beginning of the gospel, it says, it seems good to me to write an orderly account for you. Most excellent Theophilus. Most excellent means he must have been a person of high social status. And at the beginning of the book of, book of Acts, it addresses him as well. So both books are, are written to, or at least dedicated to, a man named Theophilus. And that raises a question, of, of course. Uh, who was Theophilus? Theophilus means uh, one who loves God. And so some say this is just a general reference to anyone who reads it, those who love God. Most scholars, though, think this is an individual. This was a fairly common name. This Theophilus was used as a name in the first century. Here are some suggestions of who Theophilus was. Some would say he, maybe he was a recent convert to Christianity and he needed to be instructed more on the foundation of the faith. Others say he maybe he was an unbeliever, someone who was interested, and so Luke wants to draw him to faith with the stories. Some have suggested, one of the most interesting suggestions, maybe he's a government official, and Luke, uh, Paul has just been arrested and is ready for his trial, and so Luke writes the account to sort of defend Paul at his trial. Much of the book of Acts is about Paul. That doesn't explain why he would write two full volumes, a whole volume about Jesus, a whole volume about Paul in the early church. The fourth view is really the one that is most widely held, and that is that Theophilus was the patron who sponsored the writing of Luke and Acts. To write 
a large volume, two large volumes like this, to do all the research to do. It would take a lot of time and investment. And so oftentimes wealthy patrons would pay someone to do this or would support them in doing this. Um, in Josephus, the writer Josephus, he dedicates one of his works to another individual. He calls him most excellent, interestingly enough, who was the patron who sponsored that work. So probably Theophilus may have been a recent convert, may have been, become a believer recently, but, but Luke, almost certainly, he is supporting Luke in this endeavor. And so Luke dedicates the volumes to him. Now, it's clear the volumes are meant for the church as a whole, meant to defend the Christian faith to the church as a whole, but probably dedicated in that sense to Theophilus. All right, that brings us to the key themes. The central theme of the book of Acts, we're going to call the unstoppable progress of the gospel. Because throughout the, go the, the book of Acts, the gospel moves forward and, and all kinds of obstacles arise, but nothing can stop it. And Luke wants to demonstrate that this is indeed the work of God, that the church made up of Jews and Gentiles are the true people of God by virtue of the fact that the gospel is unstoppable because God is behind it. There's a great story um, early in Acts that really illustrates this. Um, it's in Acts chapter 5. The apostles have been arrested for a second time. They've been warned not to preach about Jesus. They've been arrested a second time. And now the religious leaders of Israel are really angry, and they're about to kill them um, on the spot. They're so furious they're going to kill them. And then a rabbi named Gamaliel, very interesting character. We know this rabbi from, from secular history as well. He was a leading rabbi in Judaism. He was actually the mentor and teacher, the apostle Paul. But he stands up and he says, you know, we should not do anything right now. If we, if we press down, if we defeat this movement right now, the Romans are going to come in and they're going to think this is a revolution and they're going to suppress us as well. He said, so he says this, he says, in, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But, but if it is from God, you will not be able to stop them. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Now, Gamaliel didn't become a believer. He didn't think this movement was from God. But what did he say? He said, if this is from God, you won't be able to stop it. And what do we see throughout the book of Acts? Nothing can stop the gospel. It moves forward. No matter what happens, persecution, suffering, shipwreck, snake bite, all kinds of things um, oppose the gospel, and it steamrolls forward. Why? Because it's the work of God, because God is in it. This theme is seen especially clearly in the theme verse, what we could call the theme verse of the book of Acts. Acts 1.8, you will receive power. Jesus, just before he ascended to heaven, is speaking to his disciples. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This verse describes two great movements that are characteristic of the book of Acts. The first is a geographical movement, the geographical progress of the gospel. Where does it begin? In the heart of Judaism, in Jerusalem. But then it moves outward from Jerusalem to Judea, the surrounding re region, the province in which Jerusalem was. Then to Samaria, the country just next door. And then from Samaria, it moves out to the rest of the world, to the ends of the earth. In Acts 28, reaching Rome itself, the very center of what was viewed as the, the civilized world. So there's a geographical progress we see in the book of Acts. But beside that geographical progress, there's also an ethnic progress. As the gospel which begins in the heart of Judaism, which is the fulfillment of, of the hopes and promises made to Israel, moves outward from the Jews to Samaritans, who were sort of viewed as half-Jews or related to the Jews but not true Jews, and then ultimately outward to the Gentiles. And this ethnic movement beside this geographical movement is so crucial because it shows that the gospel was not just meant for Israel. Salvation was accomplished within Israel, but it was meant for all nations of the world. Luke's purpose then, what is his purpose? If that, that's his central theme, his purpose then is to confirm the truth of the gospel, to confirm that indeed this message of salvation is the message of God. Notice at the end of the prologue, he says this, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught, the certainty, the confirmation of those things. So why did they need certainty? Why did they need confirmation? What challenges were they facing? To understand that, we have to put ourselves in the perspective of Luke and his readers. 
Luke is writing somewhere in the mid to late first century. And by that time, by the time he's writing, really there are two institutions. There's the synagogue where the the Jews are worshiping in the center of Jewish activity. But then there's all these little churches, these house churches that have sprung up all over the Roman Empire. And they really are competing against each other, competing for converts, competing for loyalty. Both of them, the synagogue and the church, are claiming to be the true people of God. Both of them are claiming that the the Hebrew scriptures, that is our Old Testament, relates to them. The Jews are saying Jesus is not the Messiah, he's a false Messiah. The the Christians are saying, no, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the true Savior of the world. So let me ask you a question. If, If Put yourself in this situation. Suppose you're in the synagogue. This guy named Paul, this renegade Jew comes along, starts preaching within your synagogue and pulls some of your people into his little community group. And they start moving away from the synagogue. Not just that, but some of your Gentile supporters also begin to move towards this. What are you going to think about this group? They're stealing your sheep, right? They're taking away your members. And you're not going to feel very positive. How are you going to respond? In other words, what accusations would you make against them? What accusations would the Jewish opponents of the church make against the church? I often ask my students this. Put yourself in this position. You're part of the synagogue. This is your family. This is your community. And someone is coming and taking people away. It's like a cult leader, we might say, today, pulling them away, your young people. And they're enamored by this person. They're enamored by this message. How would you respond? Here's some typical responses we might expect. First of all, how can Jesus, you say Jesus is the Messiah, how can Jesus be the Messiah if he was executed as a criminal? If he was crucified, the worst possible execution. Only criminals and slaves were executed. Secondly, why didn't the kingdom arrive? Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. But who was still in charge? The Romans were still ruling. This was the kingdom of Caesar, not the kingdom of God. It looks like Jesus failed to establish the kingdom. That's a second accusation you might make. Here's a third accusation. If Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, why are most Jews rejecting him? Salvation came through the Jews, but really the vast majority of the Jews were rejecting this message. And finally, on the flip side of that, if the promises to Israel are coming to fulfillment, why are mostly Gentiles taking over the church? Why are mostly Gentiles responding to this message? So these four accusations would be the center of charges against Christianity. What is fascinating is as we read the book of Acts, we see that in a narrative framework, Luke is responding to each of these challenges. So for the remainder of our time, I want to show you how how themes or sub-themes, we could call them, in the book of Acts are really responses to each of these challenges in the church. So here's, I'm going to look at a sub-theme. Here's the first sub-theme, the identity of Jesus the Messiah. Who was Jesus? And here's the challenge that would have been made against him. How can Jesus be the Messiah if he was executed as a criminal? And really, Luke responds to that challenge with four answers. I want to give you four answers to the challenge of how can Jesus be the Messiah if he was executed as a criminal. Here's the first answer. The first answer is Jesus' Messiahship was confirmed by the signs and wonders that God performed through him. How do we know he was the Messiah? Because he performed these miracles. He performed these signs and wonders. Here's Peter on the day of Pentecost. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, you saw him perform these miracles, confirming he is the Messiah. Here's Luke's second answer. Jesus was not crucified as a criminal. He suffered innocently. He suffered as the righteous one. It's really interesting. This is the central theme of Luke's passion narrative, the story of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion. It's that Jesus is innocent. In fact, Pilate says it like five times. Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Neither has Herod. This man, he goes on to say, this man has done nothing deserving death. He goes on to say, what crime has this man committed? He says it over and over again. The impression you're seeing is this guy is innocent, and yet he's being, he's being crucified. Not only that, but when Jesus is on the cross, you might remember there's two criminals being crucified on either side of him. One of them in Luke's gospel repents. And this is what he says. 
we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Even the criminal crucified behind him says, you know, this guy's innocent. Finally, it's, it's really interesting, the centurion, the centurion who is at, conducting the crucifixion, when he sees how Jesus dies, in Mark's gospel, the centurion says, truly this man was the son of God. In Luke's gospel, he says, surely this man was innocent or was righteous. And so again, Luke is driving home this theme that Jesus is innocent. And then throughout the book, of a- the book of Acts, Jesus is repeatedly called the righteous one, the righteous one. That's a title that comes right out of Isaiah chapter 53, the Old Testament passage about the righteous and innocent servant of the Lord who dies for the sins of others. So Luke is driving this home. He suffered as the righteous one, as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. Here's a third answer to the question of how can Jesus be the Messiah if he suffered and died? The Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would suffer and die. All along, this was part of God's purpose and plan. And over and over again, we see in Luke's gospel in the book of Acts, the stress that that this was the fulfillment of prophecy. Probably the most famous of these events is those disciples on the road to Emmaus. After Jesus has risen from the dead, He he appears to two of his disciples, but they don't recognize him. And they're having a conversation with him as they travel from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they're saying, this Jesus of Nazareth was an amazing guy. We thought he might be the Messiah, but he was crucified. And Jesus responds, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Do you see this theme? Jesus explains to them, going through the whole Bible, the whole Old Testament, to show that all along it was part of God's purpose and plan that the Messiah would suffer and die to pay for our sins. Okay, here's the fourth and final response to how can Jesus be the Messiah if he suffered and died? And that is that he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead victorious. And now he is enthroned at the right hand of God. The messianic reign has begun. Peter says this in Acts chapter two. He says, exalted to the right hand of God. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So Jesus rose victorious. After accomplishing our salvation, he rose victorious. He's not the crucified Messiah. He's the crucified and risen and glorified Messiah. So this focus on messianic reign leads to the second major theme. The first theme is Jesus' identity as the Messiah. Here's a second major sub-theme of the book of Acts. And that is the Holy Spirit as the empowering and guiding presence of God. Now the question, again, the challenge to the Christians that would have raised here is why didn't the kingdom come? Why didn't it arrive? The Messiah, when the Messiah comes, read your Old Testament, the kingdom is to be established. And in fact, Luke's response is, in fact, the kingdom did come. It came in a spiritual sense. And we know that because we saw the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit's coming in Acts 2. Here's our first of three answers, three responses. The Spirit's coming in Acts 2 confirms the arrival of the kingdom of God and the beginning of the end times. The end times are identified with God when God's going to establish his kingdom. So look at Peter again in Acts chapter 2, 15. He says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. So the pouring out of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was confirmation that Jesus did establish the kingdom. Exalted to the right hand of God, he poured out the Spirit. And the Spirit, for Luke, is the sign and evidence of the new age of salvation. Secondly, how do we know the kingdom has come? The presence of the kingdom is obvious because of the kingdom authority that we see demonstrated through the apostles. For Jesus, when Jesus, during Jesus' ministry, when he performed miracles, the miracles weren't just showy signs to prove who he was. They were demonstrations of the power of the kingdom of God, of the restoration of creation. So what happens in the book of Acts? We see the 
Apostles performing the same kinds of miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, doing the same kinds of miracles that Jesus did, proving that they are people in the kingdom of God, right? Here's some examples of this. Acts 2.43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Acts 5.12, the apostles performed many signs and wonders. Acts 6, verse 8, we see Stephen performing miracles as well, all demonstrating the power and presence of the kingdom of God. Third answer to the question of how can Jesus be the Messiah if the kingdom has not come is that reception of the Spirit marks entrance into the kingdom of God. You see, we see whenever someone responds in faith, they receive the Holy Spirit. And that reception of the Holy Spirit, as we just said, demonstrates that they are part of God's kingdom. We see this over and over again. Peter says this in Acts 2, repent and be baptized and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the sign of the new age. Peter and John placed their hands on them, the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit, the sign of the new age. So the kingdom is arriving through the words and deeds of of Jesus. That's the second main theme. Here's our third main theme in in the book of Acts, and that is rejection by the Jews, rejection by many in Israel. Here's the challenge Luke is facing. How can God's promises to Israel be coming true if so many Jews have rejected the gospel? Luke responds through his narrative, once again, through his narrative with three key answers. Here's the first answer. The rejection of the Messiah is a continuation of Israel's rebellious history. Luke points out, this is nothing new. This has happened all along. Read your Old Testament and you see over and over again, the majority of the Jewish nation rejects Jesus, turns away, worships idols. This is the the main theme of Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7. You might remember Stephen. He was the first Christian martyr. And this very long speech in Acts chapter 7, the the theme that comes again, again and again and again is that you are acting just like your ancestors, just like they rejected, so you rejected. Here's a statement from Acts 7.51. You stiff-necked people, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. There's that title. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You've killed your own Messiah. You're acting just like your ancestors did. So this is not surprising to see many in Israel rejecting the message. On the flip side, however, the second answer to that question of of Israel's rejection is that actually, though, it's not like Israel's rejecting the gospel. Many are responding and receiving the gospel. A remnant has been saved. And as we read through Acts, we see an amazing number of Jews come to Christ. Look at this. Acts chapter 241. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 believe. A few chapters later, 5,000 believe. In Acts 21, many thousands have believed. So the answer is a remnant has been saved. So third, here's a third answer. Salvation comes forth from Israel and goes first to Israel. We, We must not forget, Jesus was Jewish. All of the 12 apostles were Jewish. Their number 12 indicates they were the restored remnant of Israel. It's not that Israel has rejected the message. It's that the remnant of Israel has been restored. And now the salvation can go forth to the Gentiles. It's interesting, wherever Paul goes, whenever he enters a synagogue, whenever he enters a town, he goes straight to the synagogue and preaches to whom? To the Jews first. They hear the message first. Some of them respond. Others reject. And so we see the remnant being saved. Here's our fourth and final theme. It's the flip side of of the rejection by many in Israel. It's the salvation for the Gentiles. And the challenge is this. How can the church be the people of God if Christianity is becoming a predominantly Gentile religion? You go into any of these house churches, it might be three quarters Gentile and only one quarter or even less Jewish. How can that be? This is Israel's religion. This is Israel's relationship with God. Again, Luke gives three answers to this question. The first one you can predict. Salvation of the Gentiles was promised, was predicted in Scripture, and was all along part of God's plan. In other words, this is part of God's purpose and plan of salvation from the beginning, from the fall of Adam and Eve. God had in mind to save all nations through the Messiah, through the Jewish Messiah. 
We see this over and over again. I'll just give you one reference here. Simeon in Acts or in Luke chapter 2 says, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. That's a quotation or an allusion to Isaiah 49.6. Read through the Old Testament and we see that God's salvation is meant not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Secondly, the second answer to that question is the Gentile mission was not something that the disciples cooked up. This was God's purpose and plan. We see this especially in Acts chapter 10 and 11, where we see Peter going to see Cornelius, this Gentile, and sharing Christ with them. And Peter says, this was not my idea. This was the Holy Spirit told me to do it. This was a movement of God. This is not a human movement. It's a movement of God. In Acts chapter 15, Peter says this. This is at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. He says, brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Who made the choice? God made a choice. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. The Holy Spirit was poured out on Gentiles. What does that tell you? This is not the, the, the disciples making this decision. This is the Holy Spirit being poured out. This is God's decision. So all along, this, this movement to the Gentiles was provoked by God. And that relates to the third answer to that, and that who Paul is. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, is not a renegade Jew. In other words, he's not rejecting his heritage. He's faithful to his heritage. And this is why Luke spends so much time on on Paul. The whole second half of the book of Acts is on Paul. Why? Because Paul is the model of what it means to respond to Christ. He was persecuting the church. He was opposed to the church. Then he recognized that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And everywhere he went, he proclaimed that message as a faithful Jew. Over and over again, when Paul is challenged and confronted, he says, I'm I'm not a Gentile. I'm Jewish. This is my background. I'm just being faithful to the promises made to my ancestors. Here's Acts 22 2. Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought in in this, brought up in this city, that is Jerusalem. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. He says, It's my passion for God that made me an apostle of Jesus Christ. In front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court, he says, my brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. So Paul is faithful to God, faithful to his Jewish heritage because salvation comes through the Jews to all nations. Let me just conclude by looking at one passage at the end of the book of Acts. The climax and conclusion of Acts brings out three of these main themes. We've been talking about these main themes of Acts. Well, at the the end of Acts, Paul arrives in Rome. And when he gets there, he calls the Jewish leaders of Rome to come to him. And he preaches the gospel all day long. It says, from morning till evening, Acts 28, he preached the gospel, explaining the kingdom of God to them. It says this, I'm in Acts 28, 24. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Do you see the division of Israel? We see a remnant responds, the majority reject. Um, They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through through um, through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. Paul goes on to say, therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Do you see those two themes, right? Israel is divided. A remnant believes, a majority rejects. And Paul says, we'll then turn to the Gentiles. They will respond. So Jewish rejection, Gentile acceptance. Now look at how the book ends. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in Rome in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. He proclaimed the message with all boldness and without hindrance. Do you know his situation? He's in prison. He's chained to a Roman guard. And yet Luke can say he proclaimed the gospel with all boldness, without hindrance. You see, the gospel messenger can be chained, but the gospel message can't be chained because it is unstoppable. The unstoppable progress of the gospel. There's the central theme of the book of Acts. The gospel is unstoppable because it is the work of God. As Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, 
Who can be against us? And that's what we need to recognize today, that God is for us. Remember that whenever you face challenges and struggles, whether they're financial struggles you're going through, maybe a job loss you're going through, whether it's a health issue that you're struggling with, whether it's relationship challenges or deep losses of any kind in your life, remember, God is for you. God will bring you through because he is in charge of human history. He is in charge to accomplish his purpose and will, and he will do it. Encourage someone with that message today. Let's close our time with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the message of the book of Acts, that your gospel message is unstoppable because it is the true message of salvation for all who believe. Lord, I pray that we would take that message to heart and we would recognize that you can do anything through us. Um, You can accomplish your purpose and will because you are the sovereign Lord of creation. Help us, Lord, to face challenges around us with that, that certainty and help us to proclaim the message of salvation in the same bold and courageous manner that our our brothers and sisters in Christ did so many years ago. Thank you for this time together. Help us to better understand your word and to proclaim its message to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't forget on Tuesday night, we have our our good book Q&A time, great time together. Um, If you don't have that link to that Zoom, we do it by Zoom, to that Zoom call 7.30 on Tuesday. Uh, Email Pastor Ken, he'll send it to you. Have a great week.